In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I always love reading that uh, story of Noah. You know, um, it's one of those great stories that I think we all heard and learned. Well, if you're like me, you kind of learned it in Sunday school days. But you don't hear it preached on very often. It actually doesn't come up in the normal lectionary of the church. Uh, it shows up on things like the Easter Vigil and some other like kind of special times, but it's not like a normal reading. Actually, a lot of the great Old Testament stories don't come up in the normal readings of the church year, right? Like, you know, like, you know, Samson and uh, uh, the crossing of the Red Sea. Those, they don't come up regularly. It's kind of interesting, right? Uh, but we know them and we know them because we kind of learned from them in our early days. Um, and I, so I love a chance to kind of ponder about this. Now, we're not these texts during our midweek services. Uh, I'm sure you guys are already kind of aware a bit. Uh, the theme is honest repentance is what we're looking at. And they're, they're catechetical sermons. So the idea is like we're taking a theme or an idea and we're, we're kind of wrestling with it together uh, instead of like unpacking a verse, which is, Normally what happens on a Sunday morning, right? I'm assuming, I'm assuming that's what happens here on a Sunday morning. I, I trust that that's what happens, right? So anyway, uh, so, but, so it's a little different in its, in its feel. But you get this text with the water and the flood and all that stuff. And uh, one of the things that, uh, for me personally, I grew up in Ventura. Now I know I'm back in Ventura. I, I was away for a lot of years, trust me. But... Um, I grew up surfing. Uh, any, any surfers here? No, not a one, right? That's fine, that's fine, it's okay. You're in Moore Park, you're allowed that, right? So I grew up, I grew up surfing. Uh, I surfed pretty much all throughout uh, high school, college. Um, when I went to junior college, my daughter was asking me the other day, she goes, she was asking me about Ventura Community College where she's going now, which I went there too. She's like, well, well how long were you there? And I was like, well, I was there for two years, but I only left with a year's worth of credit because the waves were really good when I was there, right? And like when I went, we were paying like $11 a unit and I was living with mom and dad. It was like, you know, if the waves are good, you're going to go surfing, right? That kind of thing. So, but one of the things that surfing taught me early on was a respect and um, an understanding of the power of water. And we all know that, man, we... For, for once in our lives as Southern Californians, we're inundated with water, right? And uh, water is powerful. Um, uh, a big wave is a devastating force. Whether uh, I can remember those days back when I was much younger and you're trying to paddle out in the big surf, uh, if you, like, you had these small windows where you could kind of make the push, and if you didn't make it, I mean, you were kind of done for. You'd have to kind of call it quits and go back on a big day. Uh, and, then, and we see the power waves. Um, it, you know, our poor pier in Ventura, it's like every time they get that thing rebuilt, the waves come back through and just tear it back up again, right? Over and again, it keeps getting destroyed. Or did you, I'm sure you guys probably saw on the news, it wasn't that long ago, the big wave at the end of Seaward. In Ventura, right? Because it made national news. I had, I had friends in like Florida texting me like, are you guys okay? I'm like, no, we're fine. You know, it's like, but those big wave came over the, at the end of Seaward and it wiped out a bunch of pedestrians over there. It's like you, you realize the power of the moving water and how destructive and chaotic it can be. Um, I remember, uh, was it 2011, I think, the big... Uh, earthquake in Japan, the one that, um, uh, yeah, caused the tsunami, right? Remember, it, it, uh, it, dist- it, it impacted the, the nuclear power plant there, right? But the footage, that was the first time I saw footage of a tsunami. And it wasn't what I thought. I don't know if you guys had the same reaction. Like, in my brain, a tsunami was this, like, giant wave, like a surfable wave, right? Like a big wave that kind of came in and, and, and it destroyed things. That's not the way it was at all. It, the water pulls out really far, and then it pushes in with such force 
man, it obliterated. I mean, I will still to this day watch footage of that, like in awe at the, the power and the destructive force of water as it pushes in. There's nothing quite like it. And, and when, you, when you take all that in, um, you know, as Christians, as, as people who, who receive the word of God, we, we know in the very beginning of the book of Genesis, God employs his word, and you can kind of see this way, in a battle with water, right? So if you remember, in the beginning, the, the earth is formless and void, it says, right, at the very beginning, right? And, the, and the, remember, the spirit hovers over the face of the waters. It's all water, and the water is chaos. It's just tumultuous. It's unknown. It's, it, it, you, there's no pattern to it. It's, it's, it's just, you know, you can't predict it, all that kind of stuff. And then God speaks his word into that situation. And his word goes to work and his word starts to divide the water. And if you remember, it divides the water first, the waters from below from the waters above, right? And then the waters below are divided out into where they can make dry land. And there in the dry land, eventually he speaks into being his garden, his creation. And water in the garden is then life. It's, you know, it brings forth fruits, every fruit in its season and according to its kind, all those things that we read in Genesis, this life and sustenance and all these beautiful things, right? And so water, because of the word of God, becomes not chaos and destruction, but life and assurance and confidence, something predictable. And then, well, we know the story, right? It doesn't doesn't stay so perfect and so wonderful, right? In mankind's rebellion, sin enters in, and, and you know, there's a driving out of the garden. Obviously, it goes on and on. And through the pages of Genesis, we get ultimately to the story of Noah, which we kind of read that portion about the flood. But if, if you remember why the flood comes, it's still one of those things that for me, as a pastor, I've been doing this for a while now, it's still kind of, it catches me a bit, you know, like, like if you read the text, God actually says he looks down and he sees how wicked mankind is. And he actually says, do you, do you remember what he says? He says, yeah, he is sorry he made them. Like this, whoo, right? Like he, that's his, and, and so what he does, his wrath, if you will, is he pulls back those boundaries that he established, right? The chaos is allowed to kind of crash back in. So in the story of Noah, as I was reading there, you know, we always, I always thought of this when I was a kid growing up, you hear the story and you go, oh, it rained for 40 days. Well, it does rain for 40 days, but in the midst of that description, it also says he unleashes the deep, right? From the foundations of the earth. And so you know, in the context of Genesis, what he's doing is he's crashing the thing back in on itself. The, the division that he had brought by his word, he pulls back and chaos just happens, right? It's all crashes in, water from above, water comes up from below, and everything is destroyed. Absolutely everything is wiped out, except, of course, Noah and his family and all the animals in the ark, right? They remain, they find this way through uh, uh, in the ark, right? But there's this chaos that comes. Um, now, as Christians, all these years later, we hear these stories. Uh, we receive the word of God. Uh, we gather and worship. And, and there can be times in which we... How would we put this? We like to think that the Christian life is, is one without chaos, right? Or maybe, maybe that's not true. Maybe you know that there's chaos in your own life, but you, you think that there's a possibility that you could get somewhere where there's no chaos, right? So what happens is this way. 
maybe you can let me know if this is correct or not. You kind of come into a church on a Sunday morning uh, or Wednesday night, right? And you, you, you have your own fights, your own struggles. But you look at other people and you think, boy, they seem to got it all together over there, right? Like they have it going well. There's, there's, there's something appealing about that. Maybe that I can achieve that. There's some, there's some life of a Christian that is separated from the chaos and the, and the turmoil and the suffering, the struggle, right? And I think most of us deep down, we, we see that in other people, or we think we see it. Because they are probably looking at other people thinking the same thing. Because the reality is, none of us actually have that, right? That we can appeal to it, we can long for it, we can want that peace, and that contentment. But in reality, we're always kind of dragging this chaos along with us. Because our lives are not simple, they're not easy, they're not nice and clean, right? So we have, as, as, even as the people of God, then we have struggles and pains and sufferings and setbacks. But we also have deep, profound regrets about choices we've made in life. We have things we wish we could undo. We have, we have people we've hurt. We've had people we've failed to help when we could have helped them, right? And, and we look at all that and we, we realize that it's not so simple as to just say, you know, well, I'm, gonna, I'm a Christian now, it's just going to be easy. It's not easy, right? I think it's, uh, I wasn't planning on saying that there's, there's uh, um, an old professor of mine. Um, he wrote a, a, a book. They changed the title. I don't know what the, t- the new title is. The original title was called Damned Through the Church. <laughs> Now you can now you probably know why they changed the title. It's not an appealing title. You're not gonna like buy that, but it's a beautiful idea. In other words, like when you're just living your life out there, away from all this stuff, you're kind of fine. And then you come to church, and you hear the word of God, and receive these gifts, and then you aspire to things, and you want to be faithful, and you strive to it, and then that's when it hits you how hard it is, and actually. Not only is it hard, but it's impossible to live up to that standard, right? And that the condemnation comes on you, right? And it's this, this tough, tough, brutal thing. So you all know, I'm sure you know, because I know you're a pastor, that you regularly read your catechism. You have it under your pillow when you sleep at night. You treasure it, right? No? Right? Yes. Just say yes. He, he might watch later. Just say yes. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Our catechism teaches us that uh, baptism uh, is, is a combination of water and the word, right? That you are, you, it is, it's not just water, but it's water uh, combined with the word of God, right? Which means that in your baptism, I think this is our struggle, is that is that there is, there is the water, the chaos, the reality of all that of turmoil of our lives, and there is the assurance and the confidence of our word, and these things are bound together, and they're actually bound together in you. And you feel that struggle within you. So you have this, this maybe that's not a good way to say it, but you have this part of you, you know, that you know the assurance of God, you know the promises He's given you, you know the confidence. That, that he, has, he has given you life and salvation in himself, and yet you feel all the chaos of this world, the chaos of your own life, the failures, the setbacks, the regrets, and all those things. And these things are in this binding up together, right? And, and we can't quite always find a way out of that. And it feels like, like we're locked into this struggle within ourselves. And, and perhaps that, that is we're locked in there until the day of our Lord's return, the day that He calls us to Him, that there's this, this locked in. But we are given by Him assurances in the midst of the chaos. So one of the things that I love is that in Scripture, we have the story of Noah and the, and the flood and all the chaos that comes with that, right? And then you have Peter 
all these years later talking about the flood. Do you remember what he says about the flood? He, he says, he, he talks about Noah and his family, and he goes, and he says this like, like we've heard this, especially as Lutherans, and we take it, we're like, oh, that makes sense. But it's, it's kind of crazy. He goes, baptism, which corresponds to that, ark, flood, all that stuff. He goes, baptism corresponds to this. He says, not as a washing of dirt from the body, but appeal to God for a clean conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So chaos, turmoil, water. He's like, baptism. Baptism is your connection to this, this upheaval, which now appeals to God for a clean conscience. So the same way that the flood was a destruction, and it was for the earth, right? For Noah and his family and the animals, in other words, for those who had his word, it was salvation. The ark becomes their salvation, right? Their, their way through the water on to a greater life, right? A, a deliverance from the chaos of all that they knew. The ark, the same moment that is destruction for everybody else, for them who had the word, becomes life and hope. And I think that's exactly what Peter's getting at for us who are baptized into Christ Jesus, that, that our baptism, your baptism, you're washing into him, you're being clothed in the garments of Christ, that in the midst of all this, this turmoil, this chaos of this world, you are carried through to this new life, right? That, that you are pulled out of it. Maybe not pulled out of it, you're pulled through it, right? By His grace to a greater thing to come, a new life centered in Him. Um, and so we have this time during Lent. Uh, we call that honest repentance this year, and you'll hear. Uh, I'm not, what did your What was your pastor's theme last week? Come on, it's this quiz. Everyone's like, ah. <laughs> it was honest repentance. I know is the overall theme, um, but that's okay. You don't have to know. Uh, purification. purification, right? So each one's going to hit on different things. So chaos, purification. You'll have faith. You'll have the law. You'll have all these different themes that kind of focus us. And I, maybe what we could think of is this, that, that for this time during Lent and, and a time for honest repentance, so maybe we say that, that let us confess that we, we have chaos in our lives, things that are beyond our control, right? Sometimes that's the hardest thing to admit, that we are not in control of it, right? That we can't circumscribe it we can't get around it right but rather we are moved by it and that for a lot of us is terrifying right that we're not the ones driving it and so and so we we repent of that we repent of believing that we are the ones in control that we are the ones determining the outcome and we repent before our god that that we in some way uh, are going to dictate how this is going to play out. And instead, instead, throughout this whole time, we receive from Him His Word. As the Catechism again says, right, it's not just water that you are baptized into, but you're baptized into the Word. And so the Word is placed upon you. The Word of our Lord Jesus Christ, the promises that He has given his life and salvation is given to each and every one of you. And in the giving of that word, may we think of it this way. In the midst of the chaos of your life, in the midst of the uncertainty and, and, and the, the, you know, how it's not a clear path necessarily going forward, in the midst of all that, what the word of God does for you is it creates a division in the water. Right? God's people historically had a, issue with the water, right? So you have Noah and the flood. That's just the beginning. You have ancient Israel, right? As they're freed from Egypt, we know the greatest story of the people of Israel, right? 
the, the great exodus. They go out, and where do they end up? In front of the Red Sea. And they can't get across. Pharaoh's army's coming behind them. And what does, what does God do? He separates the waters, and he makes a space for them. And on dry land, they cross through, and they go through victorious. The Egyptians, not so lucky, right? The water comes crashing back upon them as they enter into it, right? But then later on, you get Jesus in the boat. Remember that story where he's asleep in the boat and the storm and the chaos is erupting all around him and the disciples are like, don't you care? Don't you care that we're about to die? And he gets up. I, I love that moment. He just kind of gets up and he yells, right? Peace, be still. And the wind and the waves obey him, right? And they're calm in that moment. In the book of Revelation, uh, the throne of God stands before you. get the scene where the sea is before it and it's like glass, completely calm. And that's like just the beginning by the end of the book of Revelation. When the new heaven and the new earth come down, the image there, or not the image, the word there is it declares the sea is no more. Chaos itself is absolutely removed from the picture, right? So all this turmoil, all this, this stuff gets, this gets pushed further and further on. And all these promises are yours and they're given to you in the waters of baptism that, that in that moment you live your life here kind of on this edge, if you will. The chaos is real. We don't deny it. It's part of your life. And it can become overwhelming at times. But the Word of God is for you as well. And someday, someday soon, when our Lord returns, the water will fully recede and all you'll have is His Word and His grace. But in the meantime, He speaks to you here now in His Word and His gifts in the waters of baptism. He proclaims to you that you are forgiven that you are heirs of eternal life, that you are saved, that in the midst of the chaos, here and now, He has provided a little division where for a moment, you stand on dry ground. And that is where we find our strength and our hope. Not in the chaos of our world, not in our handling of it, but in the Word of God for you. All glory be to God. Amen.